Hey everyone, welcome back. Today I am going to delve into the murky world of making pizza dough. Uh, this is something that I've consciously avoided for the 10 years that we've had this channel. Although we have had a couple of guest chefs on who have made pizza dough. Um, I've stayed away from it, but I think, you know, I've got 30 years experience of making pizza dough a couple times a month. I might have something to pass along. So I'm gonna show you my recipe, my method that, um, that I've sort of found works for me at this point. So, four ingredients, only four ingredients. And the first ingredient is flour. Um, now, that is double zero Italian pizza flour. And when you say double zero flour, it doesn't always mean that it's pizza flour. Double zero only refers to how finely the flour is ground, um, which double zero means very finely. Uh, so you could have double zero cake flour, which has a very low protein content and is absolutely the worst for making pizza. So make sure that you get a high protein double zero flour. Now, if you can't get double zero flour, which I always can't get it here where I live in Toronto, um, or when I can get it, it's unbelievably expensive and I'm just not, I, you know, whatever. I'm not gonna pay that much money for the flour. If what is stopping you is that you can't get double zero or you can't afford double zero or you just don't wanna give in and use double zero, use bread flour. Uh, as long as it's a high protein bread flour, it's going to give you a pizza dough that is pretty good in the end. And if you don't have bread flour and you've got all purpose flour and the only thing that's stopping you is a bunch of jackasses on the internet telling you that you have to use double zero pizza flour, um, whatever, use the flour that you have. Just don't use cake and pastry flour, too low a protein content. So, you know, in the realm of things, all purpose flour is pretty good, bread flour is better, double zero pizza flour, absolutely the best. Um, and we'll probably do a video now that we've gone down this rabbit hole. We'll do a video where we, we do different flours and taste test them and just see what the differences actually are. So that was 500 grams of, of flour and that amount gives Julie and I uh, three reasonably good sized pizzas that fit in our oven. So 500 grams of flour. Now the next thing is salt. Um, and this is just coarse salt. Uh, coarse salt, of course, non-iodized, and I just mix that in. And the amount of salt um, is 3% of the weight of the flour. So 3% of 500 grams is 15 grams. 15 grams of coarse salt works out to about two teaspoons. Um, of course, it's best to weigh uh, if you want consistent results. And I just mix that in. Um, 3% I landed on because it sort of gives me a nice balance of flavor without being too salty. Anything under 2% of salt um, and the dough is really bland. It doesn't taste like anything. It's, you know, what am I eating? Cardboard. Uh, over 5% and I start to feel that it's too salty. I have seen pizza dough recipes and I've eaten them where it's as high as 8%. Um, and for me, that's way too salty. So, you know, 3% is a good starting point for you if you're just starting out making it. And then sort of you can play around from there um, and see what works for you. So I mix that in. Next up, this is just, uh, I don't know, traditional baking yeast. Uh, everyone says in their videos, especially the Italian guys, that you have to use fresh yeast. I run a test kitchen. I'm in here baking all the time. I use a lot of yeast, but I cannot go through fresh yeast cakes fast enough. Um, they don't have a shelf life. They don't live very long. This stuff you can keep in your cupboard for probably two years. Uh, so I always use the dry yeast. Yeah, if you wanna use fresh yeast, go right ahead. It'll give you a different flavor profile. Um, so this is just traditional uh, dried yeast. I'm not exactly, I'll put a thing below me here as I'm talking. And now you can put it in the water if you're not sure if your yeast is any good. I know, this is, I know that this yeast is good because I use it quite a bit. If you don't use it very often, mix it into the water and wait for it to bloom. Um, 10 or 15 minutes, you'll start to see it foaming and bubbling and then put it in. Uh, I know that this is good. I throw it right in with the flour. 
and then I just mix it in. And everyone's gonna be screaming, no! It's mixed in with the salt. The salt's gonna kill it. The salt, oh, the salt, the salt. Yes, salt um, does slow down the yeast. Uh, salt can kill the yeast. In this amount, the salt will not hurt the yeast. Um, and it's gonna go for a very long rise, so the fact that the salt might retard the yeast isn't a problem. Salt is always in bread, yeast is always in bread. Uh, for thousands of years, the two have been working together. As long as you don't put too much salt, you're not gonna hurt it. So, I put it in like that. Now, uh, oh, and that was, that was 1%. So the amount of yeast by weight was 1% of the weight of the flour. Uh, which again works out to about a teaspoon and a quarter-ish. Um, so, turn this on low, and I've got the water here. And um, <laughs> I know that everyone says that you're supposed to use water of a certain temperature and it's supposed to be warm but not too warm because it'll kill the yeast and blah, 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 blah. Room temperature water. Um, Room temperature water means that it's not gonna be so warm that it's gonna hurt the yeast, and it's not gonna be so cold that it's gonna stop the yeast from activating. Room temperature works really well. And so at this point, just running slowly, a little bit faster, the water's in there and it's gonna start to pull the flour in and form a ragged ball. So we've got a ragged ball in there. I set a timer for 30 minutes. Shut off the mixer and just let it sit for 30 minutes. I don't cover it, I don't touch it, I don't go near it, I don't even think about it for about a half an hour. What I forgot to tell you was how much water I put in there. So uh, this recipe is 60% water. So you take the weight of the flour, 60% of that weight, uh, 500 grams. So 60% of 500 grams is 300 grams. I use 300 grams of water. Luckily in the metric system, 300 grams of water is 300 milliliters. Um, and that gives me a dough that is sort of in between too sticky or too dry. Uh, gives me nice puff uh, when I put it in the oven. I have done doughs up to about 65% and I find them far too sticky to work with uh, later when we're shaping. Um, so 60% works for me. I don't use any oil. Um, I don't like what oil does to the crust. That's just me. You could put in a couple tablespoons of oil if you want or use oil at various points in the process. And I don't use any sugar. Um, I don't use any sugar. You don't need sugar for the yeast to bloom. You don't need sugar for the yeast to activate. Um, you can make the yeast work faster by adding sugar, but because we're gonna let this uh, go for a very long ferment in the refrigerator, we don't need it. And I find that adding sugar adds a flavor that I don't really like. So 30 minutes and then we'll come back and we'll give this a knead. Okay, so the 30 minutes is up and the dough has been resting. Now, this is not a true autolyze rest. Um, an autolyze rest is where you just mix together the flour and the water, and then you let it sit for, you know, between 20 minutes and two or three hours. And during that time, the water completely moistens the flour. Um, and it also starts to break the starches in the flour into the simple sugars that the yeast is going to need in the fermentation process. Uh, this leads to a dough that is much easier to knead, much easier to work with down the road, um, has a much better crust and flavor. Uh, this simple rest at the beginning has consequences all the way down the line. Now, a true autolyze, ye um, a true autolyze rest, you wouldn't have put the salt or the yeast in yet you would add them now just before you start to mix the dough and knead it. Um, I put them in at the beginning. I realize that it's not a true autolyze rest. I put them in at the beginning because I just, I just find it's easier to mix them in at that point. Uh, I still find that this 30 minute rest gives me most of what I want out of that rest later on. Um, 
So if you really want to do a true rest, you would hold back the salt and the yeast and add them in now. So let's move on to the kneading. Um, depending on your machine or whether you do it by hand on the countertop, you could need anywhere from seven to 10 minutes. Okay, so we are fully kneaded at this point. Now, one of the things that I've learned over 30 years of making pizza dough at home is that um, there's a whole lot of ways to get to the end result. Uh, there's a whole lot of different techniques that will give you essentially the same result. Uh, and you have to pick and choose which ones work for you and how far you're willing to go. Because sometimes you can go really far on doing something and it's only going to give you a tiny little bit of return at the end. So at this point, I pull it out and I put it onto the bench. And I don't put any flour on the bench. And you're going to see that it's pretty sticky. Um, and the reason I don't put any flour on the bench is like, there's my timer. Um, so as much as I set a timer for uh, kneading the dough, uh, just visually, I've made this often enough that I looked at it and I said, that's what it needs to be, and I turned it off. So um, as much as you think that timing is important, um, you're going to learn visual and touch is much more important. So what was I saying? Out on the bench. No flour, no flour at this point at all. You don't want to work any more flour into this dough. So there it is. Um, you can let this rise for an hour or two um, in a container at room temperature, get the first rise, punch it down, shape it, put it back in the container and then put it in the fridge um, for the slow ferment. This, uh, this slow ferment that I do is uh, two or three days. Sometimes I've taken it out to four days and at four days it tastes amazing. Um, so depending on what my day is structured like, I'll either let it rise for an hour or two, punch it down and then put it in the fridge or I'll just shape it, put it in the container, seal it and stick it in the fridge and not let it do a first rise, just let it bulk ferment. And between the two methods, I don't notice much of a difference, um, either in texture or in flavor. Uh, there's probably people who do notice a difference. Um, and, you know, I would encourage you to do it both ways and figure out what works best for you. So at this point, we've got a lump of dough and you can't just stick that lump of dough in there. It needs to sort of be uniform. Again, techniques. There's a whole bunch of different techniques. I see people uh, turning it over and stretching and stretching it in and stretching it in and stretching it in and stretching it in. I don't do that. Um, see it's stuck to the counter and I just grab it like this. And there you go. It's shaped. Um, it's shaped and ready to go in there. And what you're looking for when you're shaping it is you want a nice smooth texture over the top. Um, that's very important. You don't want it to be ragged or jagged. And when you turn it over, you don't want too much of a dimple in the bottom. That one's still got a bit of, bit of a dimple. So you can turn it over. And there you go. So pick that up, put that into a container, put a lid on it. And I stick that in the fridge for, for this dough, like I said, I usually go two or three days, sometimes four days. Um, if I really wanted to, I could leave this in the fridge overnight or for 18 hours and then eat it for supper tomorrow and it would be fantastic. It would still be really good. But the, the, the idea is that the longer you let it ferment in cold temperatures in the fridge, um, the better the dough is going to taste, the easier it's going to shape. Uh, you're going to get a better crust. You're going to get a better texture. Uh, pretty much everything about it is going to be better. Um, that that long ferment, the, there's nothing that you can substitute for time. Um, although we will be doing a dough where there are a couple of substitutes for time and we're going to test them back to back uh, in future episodes and see what works. So into the fridge and then we'll come back and do some portioning.
And this is what it looks like after three days in the fridge. You can see it has uh, doubled in size, probably more than doubled in size. And now it's time to portion it out. Um, I'm just starting up the pizza oven. Got about an hour, hour and a half until I'll be ready to bake. And that will give this time to come up to room temperature and have that one last rise. So the dough is really stiff at this point. Uh, use a scraper, get it out of the container and onto your workbench. No flour on your workbench. Um, and you want to just break this into, this is enough for three pizzas, so you can eyeball it. Uh, if you really want to, you can weigh it to get it exact, but uh, you don't need to be that exact. Just take a good, uh, good chance. Let's say that's about right. And now you just form it into a ball the same way that we did before we put it into the container. Um, and that's why you don't want any flour on your bench at this point. Get that nice smooth shape around the side. That one's good. Move on to the next one. Now, cover these over with a damp towel or a piece of plastic wrap. You don't want to wrap them tightly because they are going to grow as they warm up. Um, they're going to rise a little bit again. And you can put these on a sheet tray so that you can move them around. You can put them on another cutting board so that you can move them around. I'm just going to leave them here on the bench because I'm going to use them in about an hour. Um, and that's it for making a basic pizza dough. Come on back in the next videos and we'll show you how to shape the dough and we'll make some pizzas. Thanks for stopping by. See you again soon.